started? We got the door closed? All right. Thank you for all coming out tonight. My name is Dan Sparacio. I am part of Paramount Central JavaScript player team. Today I will be discussing captions and subtitles with all of you. So let's get into it. First, let me remind you the difference between a caption and a subtitle, because I see this interchanged quite a bit. Subtitles are specifically a translation of the scene's dialogue, as you see on the right. While captions convey dialogue and or narration, plus any other audio effect that may be present in the media. Also note that integral subtitles is used instead of captions uh, in many regions. So what are audio effects? That'd be cheers and applause like you see in a concert, music playing, uh, honking cars, rumbling, that kind of nature. For example, Paul's starting to play Helter Skelter here, and now he's singing Helter Skelter. But remember captions, whoop, remember captions only need to show what's integral to describe a scene. So in this scene, it may look like a subtitle, but since the audio language is English, it's also called a caption. This caption is showing that her voice is at a whisper in Star Trek, uh, along with the scene's key dialogue of my captain. But when I change the language to Norwegian, only the uh, text is displayed and the descriptive aspect of the volume is taken away. Thus, it's a subtitle. Same for Italian and French, so on and so forth. So subtitles just translate the audio. Voice narrative is a feature of automatically translating scenes inside uh, subtitles as seen inside the scene. Uh, use cases may be sign language and foreign languages. It could be a foreign language on a road sign or a newspaper headline in just a scene, but the actual English, the, the scene is actually uh, spoken in English. You could have unconventional dialogue like the Klingon example that's been kind of plaguing our industry for a while. Uh, and obfuscated audio like a police radio or slurred words, for example. Those could all be forced narratives that are put up on screen so you can actually understand what's going on in the scene. So how does this work? Well, when detected in a manifest, HLS or Dash, the current audio language determines what forced narrative track is actually displayed. The forced narrative track is only enabled when subtitles are disabled by the end user. The end user, if the end user enables subtitles at any point, the forced narrative track is shut off and the full main caption track is put for display. This track contains all forced narratives as well as the rest of the presentation dialogues and any other captioning aspects that may be in there. The problems with this that we've seen in the industry in real life and production is Content does not just all come out with every aspect of it. It's a rolling, it's a rolling catalog. We have over 8,000 VODs, tons of live at Paramount. Uh, this comes out slowly. So you get content where there are no forced narrative tracks, or there's just forced narrative for Italy and Germany, or bottom line, unmatched tracks to the audio and text track languages. Uh, that is not a big deal. It just causes inconsistency in the experiment, uh, experience. But the bigger problem is when the forced narrative is burned in from the master studio at high res. So here's an example of a burn-in. Uh, this is, says, light the beacon, and this is on Halo. It's burnt into the master from the studio. I go to change subtitles in the Paramount Plus application. I now see Italian over English. This is not good. So to resolve this, we must go back to the studio, get a clean master of the film, take all the narratives out. That takes a long time. Meanwhile, to, you know, to, for a stopgap, we have to go take all the text files around those assets, pull out all the cues that would cover up that forced narrative, not offer that forced narrative in a foreign language, and so therefore we you know, take away from our global audience. The best thing to do is to go get those forced narratives taken out and do it right so you can do multiple audio. So now I've talked about what captions are, what subtitles are, some features around them. I'm going to go into formats that we transmit to the player or, or trans, um, uh, formats that we put captions in. So first we'll start with CTA 708, the standard for closed captioning for ATSC and the television, digital television in the United States and Canada. 608 are its predecessors, if you heard of that, but it's pretty much out of date for FCC compliance as of 2002. The only difference between 608 and 708 is the ability to do multiple languages and styles and other aspects that make it FCC compliant. Another format that we use heavily is XML-based TTML, time text markup language. Uh, there's a lot of profiles in this, from DFXP from back in the flash days, EBUTT for Euro European Broadcast Union, SIMT TV here in America, and IMSC is another profile that we're looking at towards the future. 
Uh, this is widely adopted in the TTML2 spec of 2018, uh, adopted by the television industry across the board. And at Paramount, we are looking at IMSC. But for now, production, we are primarily using WebVTT. The remainder of my talk will be on this format. Uh, WebVTT stands for Web Video Text Tracks. It's molded after the sub-rip or SRT format from DVDs. It adds alignment aspects, and that's the only difference between SRT. WebVTT uh, provides captioning and subtitling, but it also provides a, any kind of metadata uh, that wants to be time aligned with audio and video. For an example of that is uh, seek previews and thumbnailing when you seek. That could be transmitted through WebVTT. WebVTT can be pretty simple to deal with at the player, or it could be a bit complex. It all depends on how it's delivered and signaled. Uh, it could be a sidecar file parsed all up front and all the cues are placed in and the whole presentation. So if you leave, it's kind of progressive and it's kind of a waste. Uh, you could segment those VTT files and send them down to the player chunk just in time. Most commonly though, in, the, in our industry at premium level content, we MP4 encapsulate VTT so it works across all devices. So here's the real fun part of all this. Regulations, conformance, and standards. So let's talk about lawsuits and why we are super laser focused right now on this topic for the last couple of years. Excuse me. Captions are governed by the FCC under the CVAA, which stands for the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. If I break it down, the FCC basically says that if it's captioned on television and reshown on the internet, it must be captioned there as well. There are so many sub-laws of that. The most important one is if it's live and it's captioned live, you have 72 hours to recaption it more accurately for the VOD or archive experience. ADA lawsuits have increased, especially Title III, dramatically over the ten, last 10 years. Uh, this does not just include captions. It's all ADA lawsuits, so it could be wheelchair ramps and everything else. But it does include blind, uh, colorblind, screen readers, everything else, as well as captions and the CVAA. Uh, most importantly here, it points out that there are regulations regarding accessibility in our space and highly uh, increased over the last four years. Why do I mention this? Well, last year Pluto TV, one of Paramount's uh, business units, was on the receiving end of the first ever fully prosecuted caption related FCC case. This lawsuit was not about captions missing from some or all the productions, nor was it about synchronization issues. It was completely about styling of the text and the font and the caption background. In my industry, just a side note here, we've not known what's actually supposed to be done here. The rules aren't clear, and until we actually were sued for $3.5 million, and now, well, I'll get into that in a second, but we finally now know what actually should be done. I took a lawsuit. So the FCC said, this action against Pluto TV marks the first consent decree, the first enforcement action related to closed captioning rules applied to the internet-based service since their adoption in 2012. So Paramount is the first at something. I just want you all to remember that. Now the FCC works closely with both, all of our internal teams around captioning to monitor aspects of captioning with rigorous scrutiny. Puts a huge lens on us, not just Paramount, uh, sorry, Pluto, but Paramount Plus, as well as sports, as well as news. Uh, this scrutiny is, is around completeness, synchronization, speed, and placement of captions, uh, and of course, styles. So how do we manage all of this text coming into Paramount, a global company with thousands of production offices. Paramount uses machine learning to analyze and autocorrect incoming text sources from global publishers, pushing it onto our, our platform. We use machine learning to generate text and to check text, but we also use humans to transcribe and translate media from scratch. We also use humans to fix all the text problems that we find through machine learning and AI. Uh, one issue that comes to mind here is the time cone alignment issue. I thought this was pretty interesting. Drop frame, drop versus non-drop frame. So in old film, which we do have a lot of in our catalog, you have a 30 frame per second non-fractional frame rate, but you have a 2997 in most modern or some, some fractional frame rate of that course, which leads to about a three second text drift over an hour. It doesn't seem like a much, but when you have the FCC looking at you, it's a lot. So our content teams monitor all this text being pushed from global, uh, you know, from all these sources with different interpretations of what the spec may mean, mean and what it means for us. Um, and our content teams monitor all this text uh, with these tools like Baton and other tools like that. Um, we detect errors, we correct them, we look for accuracy of transcriptions, completeness, speed. Uh, speed is a really interesting one because it's very subjective, but the FCC does monitor it. It's 
Like every character needs to be on screen for five sixths of a second. It's really ridiculous uh, criteria, but you can adjust speed of captioning through a tool like this, recompile it, and re-push it to prod. So here's a funny kind of cute anecdotal situation of this. I mentioned that uh, auto-generated captions is far from perfect. There's an entire talk on this tomorrow. Well, that's for Demux. Audio uh, track uh, says broil on high for four to five minutes. You should not preheat the oven. While the transcription says broil on high for 45 minutes, you should know to preheat the oven. This resulted in a fire. So here's another fun one. Uh, correct spellings of names in an, is another challenging area of AI, especially in sports names. So this scene reads, Mr. Sparacchio, he owns the restaurant. This is from the offer around the Godfather. The audio pronounces the name as Mr. Sparaccio, which happens to be my name. So I know it's the wrong spelling. And so, well, I lost my slide. Mr. Sparaccio, and so we fix it. And actually, this is something we're going to be talking at Demux next week, too. When we find errors on screen, can we fix them in real time as a user and submit them to that person's platform? Because we know it's misspelled. All right, so now for the really ugly bits about this, the web part, the part that I do every day. Rendering, positioning, and styling. So I'm going to start here with this video demo. And you're going to see native track rendering on the left and custom track rendering on the right. Please watch for the differences of the caption locations and notice that there's dramatic cue placement preserving the creative intent of the publishers. What it's trying to show is the motion of the person speaking and the role of it. You'll see problems in this, but there's a couple scenes where it actually works really well. Again, on the right, just centers the lines, and on the left, it's trying to move captions around the person speaking. So this is the scene that I would call out to be the most persuasive in that sense. You can tell very clearly on the left that who's speaking, what sentence, and on the right you have no clue if either or one is speaking because there's no narration catalog. So do people have any pre preference for dramatic placement versus center to line? Go ahead and raise your hand if you like your captions jumping around on the screen. So when you go to something like the NAD, which is uh, a conference for uh, people with hearing impaired, you'll find that 50-50 is about the answer on that one. And you also find it kind of leans towards, don't make my captions jump around. I'd rather them be centered, as long as they're not over graphics. That's a big one. So we're going to talk about facilities now on the web. Um, there's native rendering and there's custom rendering, and we're still looking at custom rendering. And the problem is, is custom rendering is the thing that allows us to do this dramatic caption placement, but the browsers and user agents do not do it consistently just in their own right. Sometimes it's way off. This is the same scene, same uh, cue points, same VTT file, but different user agents, and it's completely off the screen on the one on the left. This particular issue was middle versus center as the align value in the VTT file. This was red flagged by QA, and it caused us a lot of headache. Although we can fix stuff like this in the player, positioning cues with VTT styles is not really clear or supported. Sometimes creatives that transcribe this stuff haven't even decided what uh, screen resolution is, what, what should be used for the positioning. So it's 720, 8, 1080, is it 4K? What do we do for positioning values? What do line numbers mean? What are the safe zones in the screen for text? Uh, and of course, a lot of the features aren't even supported on web, as you can see through this graph here. Line align, for example, is the big one. 708 positions, which is the broadcast standard for transmitting in-band captions over television that comes to web, doesn't even have a completely finalized spec for transla translating positions onto web VTT standards. So it's pretty, much it's pretty much impossible to do that. So rendering positions is one thing, but rendering styles is completely impossible. Again, the FCC lawsuit was about styles. So there are these things called Q pseudo elements. There's other WebKit pseudo elements that you can attack the, uh, the actual bounding box on. But it only works partially at best. Uh, positioning the styles and native tracks and pseudo elements with CSS is basically impossible to meet regulatory uh, requirements. In fact, it may be easier to style the background of this dog than position or style the background of text. Adding style elements to the VTT file itself can work sometimes, but most user agents fail with that. Uh, it, it is good for a sentence like, this is bold, or this is italic, trying to explain something like that, maybe a learning series. 
uh, but it does not work across user agents for what we want it for, and so we strip it out of all of our content. So finally, we wanted to keep those native tracks because we've got that cool displacement and stuff. That's something very hard to do custom, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but we did need to meet the FCC regulations, so we looked at accessibility panels and figured the OS should be FCC compliant, right? Shouldn't the accessibility panel there work for text tracks and whatever you set there should be FCC compliant? It turns out that that is only the case for some people. The people that own the OS and the browsers, the vendors that make that, like Mac OS and Safari, it works perfect. Everyone else, it does not. Hbox, uh, Xbox honors these settings because they kind of own the stack inside of there, same with PS4. Uh, but again, OS and browser works. If not, Chrome on Mac does not work. So bottom line, uh, the big problem here is Tizen and LG televisions, which take most of the market share for web video playback, have no connection to this. Um, right here, we're looking at the Mac OS uh, captions panel, which is just a quick, dirty kind of display of this instead of trying to do it on a smart TV. And you'll see that only Safari renders what I've put into the box, Chrome renders some of it, and all the rest of the browsers fail to render any of those styles or positionings. So with some devices working and others not, we knew we had to recreate all this in the application. So we need to build out these accessibilities, accessibility panels in the application to meet all the devices that we need to support. Uh, these these uh, styles in Pluto TV, for example, on the left is what we had to do for the FCC case. Uh, it's eight font colors, seven font families, three font sizes, two font weights, and a partridge in a pear tree? I'm not sure. Uh, background color, opacity, text touch color, opacity, window color, and opacity. So quite a lot, actually the full gamut of what's needed. You can see, before I jump the slide, on the right is Paramount, and it's not as verbose, if you will, as far as the features. Styling captions is useful to dial in what works best for the user uh, and the media that it's presented over. You know, users may want to throw captions in a light opacity for a movie that's dark, and they may want to have an opaque background for something that's over the top of a lower third. But what I'd like to call it here is that captioning, captioning positioning is being ignored here. This actual caption actually runs up to the upper right uh, and does a roll up of three lines on the actual native rendering. So our custom rendering of this is failing in this case. So in order to apply all these styles, we must custom render the text to do this, again, because you cannot style the native text track. Uh, to do this, we hide the native text track, we render all the aspects, but preserve all the timing aspects. Uh, we, you, we, uh, when it queue fires the event, it becomes active. We get that event outside of the payload, outside of the DOM, outside of everything web-based, and the player essentially re-renders all that text and all the positions as best they can in something that is stylable. So, the key point here is that we wouldn't have to do any of this work if the text track would just be stylable to meet regulations by the FCC. There. So with custom rendering, we can solve all these FCC style problems, but we create all these other issues. So one is preserving the, uh, the um, creative intent of the text publisher. We lose that. Uh, we lose... Um, we get problems like misplacing custom rendering text over graphics, like I just mentioned. We also have multiple queue problems that we have that we have to deal with. This also happens in uh, native text tracks, but bottom line is when you're dealing with 608 or segmented VTT, you sometimes get captions that become two queues with the same time code and start time, end time, as well as um, as well as um, uh, the same text, so we know that it's a duplicated queue, and these have to be du duplicated, otherwise you see something like this on screen. So here's another fun example of font size changing the order of the text on screen. So simply because the font size is bigger on the left, the actual orders happen. The reason why this is there's a three-year-old open Chrome issue regarding queue order and control bar collision detection. It works great until you change the font size. The most challenging part of all of this, as you can tell in my voice, Connected TVs uh, are connected TVs and their inability to update Chromium versions embedded on the devices. Both LG and Samsung have very old versions of Chrome in 2017, 2018 models. Uh, new models are shipped with a one-year-old fork of Chrome. Uh, so bottom line is CTA Wave is doing work around this problem. It's a huge issue, but let me ask you this question. What's their incentive to actually make this updatable? 
I think they have an incentive to sell TVs, and my problem with that is that just to get HDR or this or that, I mean, there's hardware decoders on this, you can upgrade, but software should be upgradable. Vizio does it, Xbox does it, and some other people do, but LG and Samsung do not. And if you read the Conviva reports, those two have the biggest market share. So finally, I want to look at what I do every day, which is the player itself and the mechanics with my team. So Paramount utilizes the open source uh, libraries you see on the screen. We contribute to all three of these libraries. I was the main contributor on the library on the far right for four years. Uh, we are extremely appreciative of the entire community and publicly want to thank all the maintainers for the years. That's for DMUX. Uh, so we're going to look at HLS, and dash, HLS on the left, dash on the right. Uh, this is how we signal text tracks, and uh, they will always be in the manifest if they're in the presentation. Uh, this is a dash manifest. The segment template tells the player when and where to find the chunks. Additionally, if it's a forced subtitle, you'll see it forced as the role instead of main. And in HLS, a much simpler manifest. You have a master playlist with the X media subtitles, each one with a forced uh, property if, to yes if the packager decides that it's a forced narrative. So the way the player works is all caption formats are parsed and converted into VTTQs regardless of the starting format. Uh, it could also be a custom queue object depending on the player. Uh, each queue carries a time range of a start and an end, denoting that the time should be rendered and removed from the screen. Queues are added to the text tracks as they are parsed. The event will be dispatched as the playhead time reaches that video queue start time. And the, uh, the queue event will carry info needed to custom render that if so desired. So there are three track modes in, in HTML5 for doing text tracks and captioning. These three modes are disabled, hidden, and showing. So we'll start with disabled. If the track mode is disabled, all the queues are hidden. There are no queue events, and there's no downloading of segments in the background for optimization. If we are in hidden mode, the player will receive queue events and do all the timing functions, but it will not render uh, captions on screen. And when showing, the player will do both the queue events and render on screen for that native rendering and get all the placement pieces. So let's take a quick look at multilingual subtitle support. This enables a uh, user to seamlessly switch between subtitles during a media presentation for foreign language translations. Tra challenges here are the inability to remove a text track once it's added to the video. That is a big one. And also, each open source library takes different approaches to managing text tracks. So we're going to watch this little video demo here. And just notice that as I click a language on the left, I get some chunks downloaded on the right. Those contain the segments, they're parsed, they're MP4 encapsulated, and you see the actual text being transcribed or rendered on screen here in the bottom left real time as that happens. So that's multilingual text and how it works. But imagine that in the actual construct of what the player is actually doing. So you can get that particular example here has that many text tracks associated to it. And remember, again, there's three modes. There's disabled, hidden, and showing. And as I mentioned, there's no way to remove these text tracks once they're added. So just think of this in scale across multiple periods and presentation boundaries, and we'll get to that. Uh, this is, there is a way to clear out these text tracks, but you have to completely use the nuclear option of destroying the video element and recreating it. And that's not going to work for the really complex cases that we deal with. So while this could work, it's not advised. So we're going to look at something that's much better. This is what Shaka player does that Dash.js and HLS does not do. And we're going to look to work to refactor all of this in the next year. So instead of using multiple text tracks uh, to support all these languages, the player could just use one text track. Again, who cares then? It's one track. We don't need to move it. We give it a generic label. We don't give it a language. Uh, we would then manage everything else all the arrays of tracks in JavaScript at the upper level and just use the text track for its timing condition, uh, timing uh, um, uh, aspects. So the way this works is chunks are downloaded and transferred from wherever or detected in band. They are parsed in real time as they're received, and the parsed VTTQs are added to the single text track. There we go. So if the user switches from English to French, all the English cues in the track are cleared out immediately, and all the segments and flights are canceled. Immediately, segments for the new language are fetched and parsed and added to that track. This is done at the current playhead time. The player will not try to backfill the buffer. It will prune the back buffer, though, so that you do not seek back and get a different language. So this is kind of what happens at a language switch in a player. In all players, they do it all exactly the same. 
So my final two slides are on this really great use case. Uh, we have a VOD to live use case where there may be up to 30 subtitle languages combining uh, c combinations in 24 hour window. The list of available languages can change at any point at the program boundary or period boundary. On top of that, the player may encounter ad periods or most likely will encounter ad periods that do not have text tracks at all. Between each period, the packager or stitcher may not keep the track IDs or node order of the tracks in the same order across periods. And so all of this stuff can be very confusing for the player when it's trying to process this stuff. Uh, I mentioned you can't remove the text tracks from the video element over and over again. Uh, it's been a theme here. Uh, and this has been the case for a decade, and it's really plagued a lot of us in this industry. Uh, but you can remove the video element to destroy, as mentioned. Uh, but with that, you'll destroy all your source buffers, stall the stream, causing a huge buffer event and creating a non-contiguous playback experience, which is completely uh, suitable for content to content when you're in a playlist, but not for period boundaries or for program boundaries. The final problem with SSAI, we're talking about server-side ad insertion here instead of doing client-side ad insertion, and we're stitching on a long stream with the ad pieces all in one contiguous manifest in one stream. Uh, and what happens when the user joins during an ad where there are no captions present? There are a lot of options here, but the players typically throw up a CC button, you click it, and nothing comes on screen for at least three minutes until the ads are over. And it's kind of a bad experience only because QA flags this almost every week for us. So what can be done about all these things that I just mentioned? First, we need to refactor, like I said, the open source players to use the single track method. We are going to take that as an initiative at Paramount this year. Uh, packagers should ensure the track order is consistent with both node and IDs. When you're stitching content, if you are in control of your own ad encoding, there are some things you can do, which we are doing with half of our company. I'll just say, it, I'll leave it at that. Um, this is adding pseudo text tracks to match the content periods. These text tracks would uh, carry empty cues. The benefit of this is it keeps the player from trying to oscillate and try to find a track that's viable for the area. We've seen too many times uh, numerous bugs around this issue. It becomes a bit like whack-a-mole in resolving, uh, trying to resolve this across devices. You'll get things like you're in Spanish for text, you'll go into an ad, there's no text, and you'll come out and you're in English. And these type of bugs happen all the time for various reasons, whether it's note order or other things. Um, and we're just still trying to solve this. It's pretty, pr uh, pretty, pretty much in its infant style uh, stages at this point. So if you're not in control of your ad, ad encoding, you're gonna have to fight all of this at the player or in manifest manipulation. So finally, what I want you all to take away from this today is that we do need better facilities for captioning to meet FCC requirements. The solution for a decade has been to abandon most of the W3C facilities and implement custom rendering in order to meet FCC requirements. Forced narratives and multilingual subtext are super important to reach global reach of your content, but it can be super hard to implement, manage, and uh, due to multiple variables across the entire workflow and device landscape. We need a finalized, fully adopted streaming first caption format that meets regulatory requirements. That would be nice. Uh, maybe this is IMSC 1.1, that's what we're hoping. But most importantly, smart device manufacturers must find a way to stay current with streaming technology embedded on their devices, God damn it. CTA Wave is doing great work on this front, but we all need to join in. Thank you all for your time. Talk to you later. Ugh. That's never fun. Any questions? Questions? I went way too long, by the way, for my yeah. DMUX talk. I got to cut that thing, but now I'm at like 12 <laughs> minutes. Um, you were mentioning the, the lawsuit. So the lawsuit was, the, was that because the users weren't able to configure it to their liking? Yep. It, okay, interesting. All the styles that you saw on that menu on the left yeah. were missing at that point. I see, okay. Okay, got it. Um, and then my other question is, the last part you were just talking about between switching the, um, the languages, uh, subtitle languages, I guess, sorry, captions. It's fine, yeah. It's fine. <laughs> um, is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an English speaking person, so in, in my mind, like, hey, I study Japanese, I switch to Japanese every so often, but like, is that a, is that a use, is that a, a common thing that users encounter where they're like constantly doing this, or is this a thing where we're like, 
we want to be super performant on something that like doesn't really matter that much or it, it's it just seems like a very it's a very interesting question so yes users don't switch captions a lot yeah you, you don't style captions a lot as a user as a single user yeah you you have a preference for your colors and styles you pick them usually once on a device and it's set for your life if you will mm -hmm. um so that's why we haven't paid attention to a lot of this but mm -hmm. when a lawsuit hits you like this you start to watch a lot of aspects mm -hmm. of this so the switching of text track piece, yes, people do switch around. Um, I, you know, I really don't have a vision into what the end user actually does, yeah. uh, besides our Conviva metrics and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but we certainly see the use of it. It's globalized, right? So you see in the US, in certain regions, you have a lot of Spanish use, you have a lot of French use in certain regions, and you, we have numbers on that, of course, so mm -hmm. we obviously know we need to produce this stuff. Yeah. And But uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, you know, switching the text tracks, it's the, the whole point of my, my demonstration there with the messy wave versus the clean wave is simply because we can't remove an element from an HTML DOM. It's the silliest problem in the world. Yeah. The reason why it actually happens from the browser vendors is because there's a re-rendering, it's a garbage collection problem and it's a mm -hmm. memory issue. For some reason with the text track rendering layer, they, they, there was a remove text track and it was taken away in like Chrome 12. Uh -huh. So I don't know what what to make of that but basically and also with IMSC it's not a web standard and there is no support for any of it so all of it has to be written by developers on top of video playback and web yeah. so at this point we're ready to just move to that and the reason why that's beneficial is because it transmits the cues in HTML mm -hmm. you actually mm -hmm. render it right on screen without any conversions right now with a 708 we're going from 708 to VTT to CSS it's like a game of telephone you lose a lot of information between and ends up being just inconsistent and kind of crappy. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Any other questions? Yes, yes. So then uh, you talked about uh, HLS, Wave VTT, playlist issues. But what about Dash? Did you find like some interesting like uh, problematic use case with Dash? Or is it like everything is fine? Dash no is, players? Dash is perfect. It's the best thing in the world. I know. <laughs> but I'm not asking for the politically correct answer. <laughs> I'm asking for the real answer, man. No, so, um, no, actually, uh, we found that Dash and HLS around subtitling is straightforward. Forced narrative, straightforward. It's pretty, pretty clear to, to read it. You know, the biggest problem we, I think we see now is the fact that we have to MP4 encapsulate our VTT chunks because of Roku, specifically because of Roku, where we were doing segmented VTT files, which is just the raw text, not encapsulated. And the only benefit for that in web is you can actually read the VTT chunks. Now they're in binary, you have to actually look at the parse data inside the player. Um, but no, Dash is, is great with this. The segment template for scheduling chunked delivery of VTT is the same as, as audio or video. It's very clear once you know it. Um, so no, I, I think they're both equally fine. I have no problem with Dash or HLS. Any other questions, folks? Well, thank you so much for listening to me. I have one question. Oh, yes. So when you have languages that are written right to left or up to down, is that a particular problem? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a small problem. So do you remember two, three years ago at DMOX, there was a talk on Japanese language? Yeah. So three years I don't, ago. I'm not the person to answer. It, it is super challenging. We're having trouble. So right now at Paramount, we're just starting to look at translations of cues because we have the Super Bowl coming up. Funny story about this, 2021, I got a call during the Super Bowl from an executive saying, why the F are my captions on web over the top of the score while on Apple TV, they're upper left rolling up. And I'm just like, because the W3C, let me just do this whole speak. speak. This is where this started. This is literally where this started three years ago with Nicholas. And it was, you know, Fox, um, CBS, and NBC get the Super Bowl every three years. We rotate and we trade off and we rotate. And so we're now coming back up on this. And that same CEO or executive said, if those captions are over my scoreboard this year, so. We're now looking at how we do the positioning and stuff, and we're actually working with some of the spec writers to see if we can get some of the stuff solidified, uh, because it's a pretty big deal for us now. 
Did that answer your question? Okay, good. All right, guys. Thank you so much.